Okay, Anna, over to you. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue on behalf of Four Space and the 17 Room Exercise Organizers. As we get settled into this virtual space, we'd like to acknowledge that Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. We recognize and are grateful to the Kanyakahaga Nation for the care of these lands and waters and their teachings about the earth and our relations. Jogay, Montreal, has been a gathering place for many First Nations for millennia and today is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. Recognizing and respecting the presence and ongoing connection of these historical and contemporary communities is an important step towards building trust and creating, or in fact, renewing relationships. So as we gather here today to consider Consider the third SDG to ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all at all ages. We acknowledge that settler colonialism has created conditions that have led to disproportionately poor health outcomes for Indigenous peoples, including life expectancy rates 15 years shorter than other Canadians, infant mortality rates two to three times higher, and incidence of disease such as diabetes four times the rate found in non Indigenous populations. In light of this dark history and the ongoing impact of colonialization, may we as treaty people dedicate ourselves to moving forward in a spirit of partnership, collaboration and reconciliation as we learn together and seek actions that will take us towards a better future. We are running the 17 Rooms exercise via Force Space as part of our mission here at Force Space to create engagement around the projects, initiatives, commitments, conversations and dialogues and development across the university. So it is our pleasure really to welcome you in, the participants and the audience members, as well as the people who made this exchange happen, notably Jason Enns and Monica Mulrennan, today's facilitators, as well as knowledge brokers, Prem Suryakumar and David Ward. Welcome all. Before handing proceedings over to Jason, um, just a few notes with regards to the session. We'll be taking you through a number of exercises and we encourage you very much to participate by jumping in with a raised hand whenever you'd like to speak. Of course, those of you who are more comfortable on the chat at any moment, it is activated for you. Please uh, feel free to add any comments, words, phrases into the chat and we will be recording those for safekeeping as well. We wish you a productive and a great conversation as I hand it over to Executive Director, Strategic Initiatives in the Office of the Provo, Jason Enns. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Anna. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see you here today. And I think some other folks may be joining us in just a couple minutes. Um, just wanted to do a quick introduction of myself and Monica will do the same. And then we'll ask you to, to give a quick introduction to who you are. So we folks around the room um, are aware of who you are and what your role is at Concordia. So um, I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives in the Office of the Provo. My interest in the Sustainable Development Goals stems from and is connected to my own PhD work that focused on the, um, how universities enact their commitments to civic engagement. So in this work, I was often struck by the, the relative absence of, of a framework that, that articulated clear objectives that universities could work with governments and communities on collectively. And so the SDGs, I think, offer an interesting example of that kind of framework. And on top of this, I have my own deeply felt sense of urgency, along with many others around living outside of planetary boundaries and all the implications this has for future generations. So I'll hand over to Monica to uh, let her introduce herself. And then, as I said, we'll go around the room. Thanks, Jason. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Monica Mulrunnen, Associate Vice President Research, responsible for research development and outreach. I'm also professor in the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment. In terms of my research, um, I've had the privilege of working closely for almost 30 years now with the Torres Strait Islander communities in Northern Australia and James Bay Creek communities of Iwishti, um, really on a range of strategies that enhance recognition of indigenous authority and jurisdiction over their lands, waters and lifeways. Uh, like Jason, my, my interest in the SDGs is really motivated by a deep concern for the state of our world and a sense of urgency to contribute to efforts to, to redefine our relationship to it and, and indeed to one another. 
Um, the SDGs, I think, are, are a, a list of really good intentions. They are starting points for dialogue about how we might fashion an improved world of uh, social and environmental justice and responsibility. And as Anna reminded us in the territorial acknowledgement, these conversations also present us with an opportunity to advance our commitment to reconciliation and our responsibilities as settlers and treaty partners. That of course uh, requires us to listen to indigenous people to understand how the SDGs translate in their cultural terms and, and, and to their context of community and territorial self-determination. In the case of SDG 3, um, we know that health isn't just the physical, uh, we know for Indigenous people that health isn't just the physical well-being of an individual, but the social, emotional, cultural and spiritual well-being of the, the whole community, a whole life view that extends to relations with territory and non-human others. So, um, yeah, over back to you, Jason. Thanks, Monica. So we've introduced ourselves and I'll we'll ask uh, you all to do the same. Um, I'm going to go just in order in which I see folks on my screen and maybe I'll ask uh, Deborah for you to start. Good morning. My name is Deborah Cross and I am um, an assistant director at the Perform Center in charge of experiential learning uh, opportunities and community engagement programs. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Gabby. Good morning, I'm Gabby Sabo. I'm a registered nurse and health promotion specialist at Health Services. My role gives me insight that I hope will be helpful as the university works on SDG3. Um, at the clinic, I witness the increasing prevalence of lifestyle illnesses among our students. Illnesses that we used to think about associated with older age are presenting in our students, things like prediabetes, insulin resistance, cardiometabolic abnormalities. Similarly, at the clinic, we serve students experiencing mental health challenges and healthy lifestyle behaviors, like being able to access regular exercise and getting plenty of good sleep are part of comprehensive treatment plans for diagnoses like anxiety and depression. So I hope that we'll be able to make the healthy choice, the easy choice, the default choice at Concordia. Great, thanks, Gabby. Uh, Shogig. Oh, you're still muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm the Senior Advisor, Strategic Initiatives and Special Projects uh, from at the Office of the uh, Vice President Research and Grad Studies. Uh, and I'm right now I'm involved in uh, kickstarting uh, discussions around the Community Health Hub of the new School of Health. So um, I'm hoping for a fruitful discussion. Great, thanks for being. Lynn. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Lynn Roy and I'm the Assistant Director Research Oper uh, Strategic Initiatives and Research Operations at the Perform Center. So I'm looking forward to learning more about all the activities that are happening at Concordia and seeing the direction that this will go in. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lynn. Shireen? Good morning, everyone. Shireen Zanadiri. I'm uh, new to Concord new and old to Concordia. I've just taken on the role of Director Experiential Learning and Cooperative Education. I uh, used to be at Concordia in the past. Um, I headed up, I created the, uh, the uh, CMS, the Career Center from the ground up back in 98. My interest um, with SDGs is my, um, I worked with uh, WHO and UNICEF for the last five years um, as a senior um, advisor in capacity building and in learning and helping individuals that work for the organization meet their objectives and goals. So it was very close, especially with WHO, with everything dealing with health and the impact that it had. So it's something that's close to my heart. That's great. Thanks, Shereen. William, Bill. Hi, yeah, Bill Bukowski. I'm a professor in the psychology department. Uh, my research 
is about uh, features and effects of children's experiences with their peers. Uh, the basic premise of our research is that sustainability at the level of the person is determined largely by experiences within the social context. Uh, students in my lab are from both Montreal and also from a city in the northern part of Colombia and Latin America. Uh, we do longitudinal studies trying to understand what, how various aspects of children's experience of their peers function uh, to uh, affect well being and how they vary as a function of the contextual constraints. Super interesting, amazing. Uh, we have um, a few folks who uh, said they would be here and haven't shown up yet. We have somebody who's trying to get into the room, so we may um, give an introduction a little bit later to who that, whoever that is. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it for now because of the fact that we have some folks who are trying to join but aren't here yet. And I'll pass it over to Monica to give an introduction to our exercise today and to help us get started. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jason. So we're a relatively small group here today as, uh, well, some people are waiting to come in, but um, but we've we've deliberately kept these groups fairly small too, to, to really support um, better conversations in many ways. Um, but it, we've also aimed to include faculty, staff and students so that this is really a whole of the organization effort. Um, We've aimed to include a diverse range of people, perspectives and experiences in terms of who we've invited to participate. Um, so before we start the conversation, um, we should note the very substantial work being done in this area, in the area of health and wellness at the university right now, um, very much reflected in the creation of the, the School of Health. Um, some of you may be involved in discussions being held right now around the community health hub. Um, and they're of course very relevant to what we're doing, but um, our aim here today is whether the SDG framework is helpful for advancing or focusing or further deepening this work. And we see this conversation as a starting point with a need for more perspectives and input and discussion of ideas um, of any ideas we think deserve to be uh, pursued. So in terms of the um, agenda, we really have today, as you'll see, we've got four exercises. The first two um, are relatively short. Um, the first of them will address benefits and critiques of SDGs. Then we'll move on to have another, you know, about 10, 15 minutes around what's happening at Concordia around SDG3. Uh, we'll then move into a discussion on university relevant targets for SDG3. We'll take a break and come back to an ideation session. So really a brainstorming um, around how to, really how to, to work with the framework, the extent to which it can um, can deepen and advance uh, the work that is already happening. Um, so in terms of the first of these exercises, um, hand over, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's the agenda. Um, so what we aim to come away with then is a sense of opportunities for what we're doing around health and wellbeing at Concordia. This conversation and the 16 others like it uh, will help us determine how we want to engage with the SDGs as a university, where we might focus our efforts. And the, outcome, the outcomes of the 17 rooms exercise will feed into the voluntary university review, the VUR, which is an institutional self-assessment using the SDG framework. Right, thanks, Monica. So I'm going to lead the first exercise, which is just a, a high level um, kind of group review of the SDG framework to identify some strengths of that framework and some limitations of the framework. So um, this won't be a full airing of the case for and against the SDGs, but we're just trying to, um, to get a read, uh, familiarize folks with some of the positives and, and some of the critiques of that framework so that we can carry that with us through the next part of the exercise. So first of all, we're just going to have a look uh, on the positive side of the ledger. 
at um, some of the benefits of this framework. I'll just talk these through quickly and then we'll ask you to add or elaborate on anything here that um, that you think is, is interesting and compelling and even articulate your own interest in the SDG framework personally. So uh, on the, the benefits of the SDGs is that create, they create a common agenda facilitating collaboration around shared goals. Um, they connect economic, social, and environmental aspects of sustainability. So it's not just environmental, but it includes uh, these other dimensions, uh, a holistic uh, sense of, um, uh, of what it means to undertake sustainable development. They place emphasis on clear and concrete targets and outcomes. They're very specific. There are clear targets and there are clear indicators associated with each of those targets. And the focus is not just aspirational uh, statements. It is uh, attaining those, um, those goals and objectives. And by setting a 2030 deadline for achieving the sustainable development goals, they build a sense of urgency. So I'm just curious uh, for folks in the room, does this, um, how does this resonate with your own sense of what the, the potential benefits are of the SDG framework? Are there things that are exciting and motivating for you about this framework? What, what would you add to this list in terms of um, uh, what's, what the potential benefits are of engaging with and utilizing this framework in, in their work? Just ask. You can um, just say things out loud, or you can also put things in the chat if somebody else is, is, uh, is speaking and you're wanting to capture your thought. We'll, we'll jump in first. Well, I will go. I'm very excited about this. I'm grateful to see that healthy lifestyle and um, behavior change and healthy environments is recognized as part of sustainability. And I'm eager to move forward. We need to help the university meet, meet the commitments it's made already. And this is great. Let's go. That's great, Gabby. Thank you. Anybody else wanted to jump in on, um, on and how they can see the potential, how this framework can be leveraged or how it, um, how it might benefit your own work? I see there's a couple of new, new folks joining in here, welcome. We'll just maybe pause here quickly to, to do some additional introductions. Um, let's see here. I have I, somebody that looks that says connecting to audio and we'll see who's, whose name pops up there. Anne-Marie, you wanna give a quick introduction to yourself and um, uh, just who you are, what your connection is to Concordia? Oh, you're, you're muted still. Sorry about that. Um, my usual connection is not working, so I'm yeah. <laughs> improvising. My name is Anne-Marie Lanctou, and I'm um, manager of Community Health Services at Concordia. Oh, great. Thanks for joining. Thank you. And we have Lucia as well. Hi there. I'm just going to chime in from, from the background, but nice to see all of you. I'm going to be listening in. Um, and I'm at the Institute for Cooperative Education and very interested in, in wellness and and sustainability and well-being in the world. That, that's great. Thanks, Lucia. And Lisa, you also joined uh, before, uh, after we did our initial round of introductions. Sorry for my uh, lateness. Um, my name is Lisa Dejou. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an affiliate uh, assistant professor, I suppose, uh, with Concordia. And I'm uh, I'm working on a a grant around mental health and the Black community, and so um, that is one of the things that I'm interested in. And I'm also interested in uh, potential collaboration with uh, Africa in terms of mental health. Always sort of mental health. Yeah. That's great. Welcome everyone. So we've um, we've gotten a brief introduction to the exercise. We've uh, just done a quick review of, of the kind of positive side of the ledger in terms of what the SDG framework, what its benefits are and how we can utilize it. 
And now we're gonna to flip to the other side of the coin, which is critiques of the SDGs. Um, we're just gonna articulate four quick ones here. And then if anybody else wants to elaborate from their own perspective, uh, what, what this framework's um, limitations are, then, then we'd love to hear those. So first of all, um, as we all see, there are 17 sustainable development goals, each of which have seven or eight targets, each of which have three or four or five indicators. It's fast. It's difficult to know where to start and how to engage. Um, so the comprehensiveness is a positive, but also a potential negative. Um, secondly, the SDGs fail to adequately take into account the rights, interests, and perspectives of Indigenous peoples. There was not formal Indigenous representation at the UN when these um, the, the goals were ratified in 2015. Um, and um, therefore, the integration of Indigenous perspectives is not built into these goals. Uh, the SDGs, another uh, critique is that the SDGs don't go far enough in addressing root problems. They're kind of epiphenomenal. They're just addressing the symptoms and not the causes of some of the things that they're targeting. And another critique is that um, they are sometimes internally contradictory. In other words, how do we, can we actually achieve and pursue and achieve economic development at the same time as preserving biodiversity? So there are some internal tensions and even contradictions in the SDG framework. I'm just curious if anybody else has any um, anything to add on this side of the ledger in terms of what they see the limitations of this framework being or things to be careful about in, in utilizing this framework. Just give a minute for folks to chime in or share thoughts in chat. I could just say a few words from the perspective of the person who tries to do research on some of these issues. Um, the you know the advantage to the uh, vast nature of the items is that it gives you some leeway. Mm. Um, it, it, unless, unless you start with the perspective that you have to assess everything all the time in some comprehensive way. If you do that, you'll drive yourself crazy. But it is a it is sort of a goal uh, to, I mean, I, I can only speak about my own studies of trying to truly understand children's functioning within a particular context. Um, that's hard to do because you often cannot get very good information about some things, or it may be that the information isn't particularly available for a specific context, but it does give people a goal, and that's I think really important. Um, and also, the ability, your ability to study these issues, has become a lot easier in the past, say, twenty years, because the, the statistical techniques that are available to us now are uh, more comprehensive and can take into account multiple levels of social complexity at one time. So in many respects, I think that, uh, that if you think of the goals as inspirational, as opposed to being a specific formula that you have to follow, that they're pretty useful. I don't know. Do you, do you actively engage, Bill, with, with this framework or the goals that are articulated in, in there, or do you, is it not really kind of integrated into your own work at this point? Yeah, that's a hard question for me to answer. Uh, I'll say that if, if you're asking me if I look at this chart every night before I go to bed and decide how I'm going to try to address these the next day, I don't. But many of these ideas have been, at least in my domain, there for, they were there as a hope 40 years ago. And as I said, now they're sort of as a reality. Yeah. And I will also say that in terms of engaging with institutions and so on, well, it's always been the case that if you're going to do a project, you have to get help from people. Mm. And so at least for the kind of stuff that I do, you have to be able to interact with schools and school boards. And, and so the idea that you would, that you would do your projects in concert with other individuals well, that's just the way it is. It just you can't do it without it. 
Uh, most of the time, that's a good thing. Sometimes it uh, it's a script written for disaster. But uh, for the most of the part, it's a good thing. And of course, it varies as a function of whether the partners want to do anything with you. True. you know, they, they may be more less interested in you than you are in them. <laughs> and and not because not because they're not interested, but because their hands are full already. Mm-hmm. They already have a full menu. And so when I come along and say, hey, let's do something, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> don't I have enough to do already? Yeah. And developing these ties, particularly at a distance. Um, I I can only uh, I mean Lisa mentioned about doing studies in Africa. Um, you know, unless you have have close ties with people in the place where you're trying to do a study, even if that study is Montreal, um, then it's a tough row to hoe. And uh, part of the process is is trying to develop those links. It, mm-hmm. it takes a while. Yeah. That's uh, the, those are super great reflections, and they'll carry through our all of our considerations today about um, in the in the kind of what we might do. Uh, section of our of our conversation today, that's super helpful to to hear you talk about the the fact that uh, th- this shared high level relatively globalized set of, of goals and objectives that people can organize around is a is a potential help with all the limitations that that we have around actually finding ways to do collaborative work when everybody's plates are full. That's that's super important. Um, one more fo- uh, person joined us quickly, a quick introduction, Gaia, and then I'll hand it over to Monica for us to kind of get a sense of what's already on the landscape around health and well-being at Concordia. So Gaia, quick introduction, who you are, what you do, what your interest is in the SDGs. Apologies for my um, d- d- delay. I was in a meeting for an electronic health record for Concordia, which is super exciting and we badly need. My name is Gaia, Director of Campus Wellness and Support Services, where I oversee health um, health services, counseling, psychological services, and the Access Centre for Students with Disabilities. There's a lot of really, really good work um, across the Canadian environment as it relates to campus well-being that is trying to align us on a national standard um, as it relates to mental health. There is also conversation and Gabby may have um, discussed this around the Okanagan Charter around health promoting campuses that ask us to think globally. So all of these um, interests are aligning really, really well with, with Concordia's interests in, in, um, in global SDGs. Amazing. Thanks, Gaia. Yeah, it feels, it feels like a good, a good moment in, in that respect. So, uh, Monica, I'll hand over you to walk us through kind of uh, mapping out what's, what we know already is happening in the Concordia landscape, and then we'll we'll take some further steps in about thinking about the SDG targets that Bill wakes up every morning and reviews before he starts his day, and then do some brainstorming about what can what might we aspire to do, and what are some immediate steps we might take uh, to get us on our way or advance us further uh, on our way. Monica. Great. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, so here we want to really just develop a picture of what's already happening at Concordia around health and wellness. So we've begun to map that out to to some degree, um, but we'd like to get a fuller picture. So if we can just spend a few minutes looking at what we have here so far. So here's a slide that shows some of the things that we know are happening around, you know, that are related to this SDG. What we're trying to do here is capture things that have some degree of visibility and discoverability um, to our students, to the internal community, as well as to the the public. So in terms of scale, we're not looking at individual research papers, but at the the level of research programs and initiatives. We're not looking at individual classes, but ideally programs or, or courses um, or course clusters. So yeah, I'd like to take a few minutes to to work with you to identify what's missing, what you know um, what we can add to this that's already happening at Concordia. you know if there are courses, clusters, research projects, um, university services, um, and you know, feel free to use the chat to to add things. You know, just uh, things that come to mind there. 
And Shohik, I wonder if I could maybe call on you to, I mean, given the School of Health and just a quick update, not everybody maybe um, just aware of where that's at. If, if you could just give us a quick uh, a brief yeah. observation where it's at. Great. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, of course. Uh, so the School of Health, uh, as you might know, has been uh, recently launched and we have uh, three hubs, uh, three main hubs, uh under the school of health um one of the things that i'm i'm really working on at the moment is the community health hub which is one of the least developed uh so to speak uh hubs um and and the we're currently doing some uh consultation slash conversations on on the kinds of research that are happening and how anyone at concordia who's really doing anything related to community health uh, whether really focused on it or tangentially related to it, might you know find themselves uh, you know uh, interested in the community health hub and being part of it, uh, or 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 doing or benefiting how they could benefit from it and and uh, and how they can make these connections both with other researchers at Concordia uh, and outside of Concordia, uh, with especially with the uh, you know community groups, organizations. Uh, and so on, and so we're 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 there at the moment, uh, and uh, so the other two hubs, which are more clinical, biomedical, uh, already have their scientific directors, and we're currently working on uh, once this uh, community health hub is kind of formed in, in a more concrete way, uh, a scientific director will also be recruited, uh, will be will be hired, um, but uh, essentially uh, these conversations are. Focusing around five, four, four themes primarily. Um, of those four themes, we have already had some discussions around. Um, uh, uh, so, for instance, in, yes, two days ago there was a discussion around environment, infrastructure, and public health. Things like urbanism, urban planning, and health outcomes. Uh, you know, cities. Uh, how you know cities? We can shape uh, you know health outcomes for individuals living in cities or, you know, access to services for individuals uh, in cities or other areas, uh, rural areas, the urban rural divide, that those kinds of, you know, research that are happening at Concordia and how we can capitalize on those and, and make these connections uh, with uh, with uh, maybe communities and, and community organizations. Um, we also have had some discussions around uh, narratives and, um, representational practices of body and health. So things like uh, how um, medicine and how health uh, and well-being are viewed, how they are represented in literature in, uh, you know, uh, in other sorts of narratives, uh, in indigenous narratives, uh, and, you know, those kinds of things, and storytelling and, and uh, history of populations, uh, those kinds of things. It's very broad, but it, it's also kind of, it brings together people from different areas that might be interested in doing research on these topics uh, and making these connections. So that's what we, where we're at. And we're also doing some other sessions on things like uh, social justice and biopolitics, which would, would tackle uh, health uh, as, as it relates to you know, gender rep reproduction, women's rights, you know, sexuality, uh, inclusivity, uh, indigenous populations, uh, you know, uh, uh, other uh, underrepresented minorities or other minorities, uh, uh, children, uh, youth, uh, you know, uh, alcohol consumption, mental health, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and we're also, uh, also tackling things like elderly, uh, you know, care, elder care, fitness, these kinds of things. So it's very broad, but it's also bringing together these people and trying to to find a focus around these topics uh, to see how they might fit into a community health hub and then how that could shape the community health hub. Uh, so I, do, I don't know. I mean, the, I, I hope that is helpful um, to, to and, and useful for people um, for this discussion, at least. That's great. Thanks, Shuri. So a lot happening. I mean, on this slide, we've identified the research, many of the, the research units. So quite an established uh, infrastructure around health. Um, a lot happening in education. And in fact, I would say that of 
of all the SDGs, there seems to be quite a good coverage in each of the areas. Some of them are quite strong in terms of perhaps the campus initiatives, but weaker on the research. There's, there's activity happening at all levels around research, which is, which is really good. Um, any other any other suggestions um, for things we've missed or Bill has mentioned, of course, the, the tremendous work that happens in psychology. I mean, we have the, the, the research units, but obviously there's a lot happening within whole departments um, that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I'd just like to say, um, you know, from the Perform Center, because I take care of both education and community programming, one of my goals is to take the research and take the evidence-based research and take that into knowledge translation into the community programs and at the same time have multidisciplinary experiential learning opportunities for the students so that there's students from multiple different departments and, and you know multiple different disciplines where they can all work together because I really do think at the end of the day health is sort of mind, body, heart and soul and that you need to have a whole group of people to actually keep someone well these days. I mean, it's not just like the medical bend. You need to have, you know, creative art therapies um, or, or music therapy. You need to have the exercise component, the dietetic component, psychology, applied human sciences. So that's what we're trying to do at Perform is to take that research, make a community program based on that so we can have knowledge translation to the community because Research papers are great, but if you, nobody reads them to see what they are, you need to get them to the people that really need to know what that information is. And then at the same time, sort of embody the students to realize it, it does take a village to keep someone well. And that those kinds of connections going forward into the, like their professional life will, will really you know, hold them in great steed. So those are some of the things and the goals that I'm trying to do at Perform. That's great, Deborah. So this idea of these three separate columns, you know, to think of the the overlaps and the integration, it's that's really that's that's wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other observations, comments? Just in terms of our existing landscape, when you think of health and wellness at Concordia, you know, clearly we have some strengths in. Uh, in many areas, but Monica, if I may also add to to what Deborah was saying, because one thing that that strikes me, and I think Shireen touched on it a little bit also when she was introducing herself, is the important role that we can play in in converging. I'm looking at the the list and converging everything for capacity building. Capacity building to me is so strong and so important. And as Deborah said, it's great that we're doing research and that we're offering programs. But at the end of the day, it's to build every individual's capacity to take care of themselves, to manage their health, their mental health, their well-being, their communities. And I think that that's a really important thing to see. And so I was really pleased to see School of Community and Public Affairs on the list because we know that they actually offer, they have a program in that community economic development. And I think that that's a very important role that transcends very much so into the community and the role, again, that we can play. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, a lot of a lot more attention these days to the impact of research. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I'm not sure if we can just have a look at the the next slide. You'll have seen it in your package. Like this, this is quite telling in terms of the the, the research concentration. Top. Uh, <laughs> Top of the, the pyramid there is the SDG3 with an outstanding number of publications relative to, to many of the other, well, to all of the other SDGs, but clearly um, the message being that, you know, it's one thing, the publications, but having the impact reaching um, the community, engaging, that's, uh, that's really where it's at in terms of transformative um, research and aligning with uh, the SDGs and their, um, their goals. So, um, yeah, well, maybe Lisa, yeah, you wanted to come in there. Yeah. I, I think that there's a lot of uh, opportunity also um, 
within the community like right i feel as though there is a lot of um opening uh within the community to make uh connections with the university at the at the moment i knew i know that for the partners that i'm working with it 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 feels like a very uh, uh, hopeful alliance with all kinds of different you know uh, avenues the research the the trans shift the, tra the the center for social transformation there are all kinds of ways in which uh concordia i mean i feel as though concordia is is really partnering with pe with people and communities yeah i think there's a lot in this moment i mean obviously at the tail end, hopefully, of this pandemic, you know, there's been, a, there's a lot of exhaustion and people are feeling, um, feeling quite a bit of despair, but there's, there's also, yeah, there's some really positive signs and this does seem for a moment in terms of the ability to do things differently. Um, so in... I think Gaia might have... Wanted... Sorry, Gaia. Apologies, I, um, I had some thoughts, but I think the slides were about our current landscape. So I'll defer when we start thinking and brainstorming about a future landscape. Okay, well, <laughs> great. <laughs> Hold on to those ideas. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so in terms of where we're at, um, if, if you have any additions to make to what we're currently doing, I mean, if you can pop them in the chat, it's really good to for us to build up um, that mapping exercise. Um, but the question we're posing here is really in view of all of the work that is going on, how can we be more impactful around health and well-being? What, if anything, does the SDG framework challenge us to do or to do differently in relation to what we're already doing? And we're thinking both, you know, we're thinking about impact both in relation to work on our own campus and operations as well as out in the world. So more directly responding to the SDG targets and, and goals. Um, I'll take my opportunity here then. <laughs> um, well, she, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so a few thoughts when I saw the um, slide of the three categories of how we've divided Concordia's current landscape. And I completely agree, there's research, there's, there's education, and there's service delivery, and there needs to be a lot more integration between those three silos. There isn't enough yet, including in how services can inform research and how research can, in, can inform service. There isn't enough yet. There also isn't enough research being done on the campus reality. There's lots of research being done writ large on, on health and wellness, which is fantastic. But the campus reality is a singular reality. So let's take um, mental health as an example. We did a research project with the Department of Psychology tracking stress and symptoms of, of anxiety and depression over one academic year, um, following 1,000 undergraduate students over 16 time points. And we learned through that research study that anxiety and symptoms of anxiety and depression change over time, but also that symptoms tend to be elevated in the fall, not in the winter i.e. they're higher in the fall than they are in the winter. And I say that because there is a lot of contemporary myth sometimes, or just a belief that winter is a really, really crappy semester. So of course, we're just more stressed out and we're more anxious in the winter, not in an academic environment. And I say this because this also resonates with some of my experience leading um, departments, uh, well, pre-COVID and in other settings where fall tends to be the, um, the um, harder month, sorry, semester, so while I love that we're doing research in multiple areas, I would love to see us reach a stage where we're also doing research that is relevant to a campus context. Mm -hmm. I also agree very strongly with, with what Lisa was saying is that community is very absent, conspicuously absent from our current um, landscape. And the fact is that if we want to reach our targets, we cannot be divorced from community. We need to figure out better partnerships in how we gain access to services, how we access the information, all of that. Fantastic. Thank you, Gaia. 
an, an excellent, I think, segue into the next exercise, which is really focusing on the prioritization, adapting the, the targets. So over to you, Jason. Thanks, Monica. Uh, this, is, this is a super great conversation so far. We'll take about the next 15 minutes or so to, um, uh, to approach the question of how to be more impactful by thinking about the ways that the UN SDGs ask us to measure our impact, and that is the targets that they set. So we're going to be responsive to that set of targets. What we want to ask you to do is to think about which of those do you think Concordia has the most to contribute to or that are most relevant to us as a university. And then we're going to kind of approach it from the other side. And if we were to establish our own set of targets, what might they be? So just as a quick introduction to these targets, um, as we know, the SDGs um, are a negotiated agreement among UN member nations about how to define sustainable development. So these targets were written with countries in mind. So what we're going to do is take these at face value and think which of these targets that are articulated for countries are we best aligned with and the most have the most to contribute to. And then secondly, like I said, we're going to step back and say, okay, if we were writing our own targets, what, what might we target? We don't have to wordsmith this, but like how might we adapt those or localize those to our own context? Um, so uh, what we're going to do uh, in order to assess people's sense of which of these are most relevant and we have the most to contribute to is we're going to run a quick poll. And um, what you're going to do is just simply select. Uh, there are nine here. We're going to ask you to select three that you think are the most relevant to, to us as a university and that we have the most to contribute to. If you don't feel like you have a universal sense of this at Concordia, if you don't have enough of an overview, think about which three up to three are most relevant to you in your own work. So we're going to run that poll quickly, come back and discuss the results, and then um, approach this from the other side of, of, uh, of the equation. The poll should be showing up for you, and we'll take just a couple minutes for each of you to answer that. Good folks, just one more minute. And we'll close it off. Doug, show us the results. What do we have here? Ah, interesting consensus and alignment. Around 3.4, reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases and promoting mental health. Strong focus on preventing and treating substance abuse, reducing road injuries and deaths. And then down below, also around some of these, I'm not sure why they letter some of these um, lower level indicators. I think it's because they're more precise research and development around universal access to vaccines and medicines, although we all see that universal access to vaccines doesn't always <laughs> result in what we wanted to. Um, so I'd be curious here of, in terms of, of folks' responses to what they uh, see in the poll or even your own, uh, just explaining your own sense of where we have the most potential, where there's the most relevance for us in terms of these indicators. Um, just um, thinking about your own choices. I'm just curious to hear what folks' responses are to, to this poll outcome. Surprise anyone?
I'll start. Um, yeah. It doesn't surprise. I, I really like that 3.4 um, got a significant number of, of votes and it makes sense um, given what we're seeing currently, but even pre-COVID on the importance of mental health, but also non-communicable diseases, for example, obesity. Um, I'll just make a shout out to 3.8 because that's what I voted on. And the reason why I voted on that is because not everyone has access to something as basic as EAP. It depends on their collective bargaining unit. It depends on whether or not a student is a graduate or not. It depends on, on a variety of things. So it isn't truly universal within the campus context. Mm -hmm. So as we move forward and we try to make sure that people have access to services um, and perhaps access to a better service coverage, that could be an, an, an interesting component to um, explore further. It sounds to me like a candidate Concordia specific target, <laughs> which is super helpful. That's really the transition we're trying to make is how do we take these broad universal country oriented targets and then localize them to our own context? And that's, you've made that transition. That's great, Kaya. Anybody else want to comment? Lisa, I saw you giving the two thumbs up to the universal health coverage uh, comments that Gaia was making. Do you want to jump in and I was thinking about I was thinking about how to me what I was hearing was that the mental health then became sort of uh, included into the 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 health coverage which it's it's not yeah. now which is which is really really lovely um, uh, and I was thinking a lot about um, there's for having worked with uh, in EAP services for over a decade uh, I was thinking a lot to i don't remember if it was deborah who was talking about capacity building i feel as though there's a piece where yeah i feel as though there 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 there's something about uh learning more about how we can take care of our mental health and like making it less expert quote unquote specific i think would be something I don't know if that is that is uh, aligned with what we're trying to do, but when I'm thinking about community, I feel as though there, there's something in the way that mental health is proposed that is not um, sustainable in as a as a model. Mm. Mm. Can I just jump in for a minute? Um, I I agree, as I usually do. I agree with Gaia. I find that one of the biggest things that we can do is start internally it's you know the the the, the huge goals are are great but i think you have to start within your own house and one of the things one of the ones that i thought was very important was the non-communicable diseases and we all know about the chronic diseases that obesity can cause um you know diabetes heart conditions there's like a whole slew of them that doesn't suddenly pop up when you're 45 or 50 or 60. They start a long time ago when you're younger and you're into those kinds of habits. So I think that as a Concordia community, it's one of the things that we can strive for with our students is to work on those really good habits that will give you long-term health and that will really, you know, obviously be good for the rest of society, but also for your mental health as well. And as I said before, to look at things as a whole mind, body, heart, and soul continuum of health. And it's not just, I need to lose five pounds, I'll lose them and then I'll forget about it, to really get into good health habits. And I think that's that's something at Concordia as a community with health services, with Perform, with the School of Health, with the various disciplines that we have, if we do start working together as a community and then bring in our community partners as well, where our students can give out that experience um, we're hitting those targets, but we're hitting them in-house and we'll be able to make a difference. That's super interesting. Just, just quickly, Gab, before I get to Gabby and, and Bill who have their hands up, just um, just curious from Deborah, from your, your perspective or, or Lynn, um, in your work at Perform, do these, uh, uh, the, the preferences or the, the votes on the targets align with your sense of where we have the most to contribute? Yes, in my, yeah. In, yeah, absolutely for me. I'm not okay. going to speak for Lynn, but I'm sure she, as uh, we usually do, we agree with each other. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, to be honest, when I was voting, I was thinking through what the capacity is at Perform and, and my top three were there. So yes, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Super representative then. That's great. 
Uh, although we don't want to, like Gaia, you may have been, I don't know, 13%, maybe one of the only people that voted on universal health coverage. We're not trying to ignore that. We're just trying to see kind of where the where the consensus lay. Gabby, why don't you jump in and then and then Bill? Thank you. Um, building on what Lisa and Deb shared, I absolutely agree. And there are some things that we already understand and we know to be true. And I think that we can act on. Uh, we know that sleep deprivation increases suicidality threefold. And we know that regular exercise is associated with a reduction in suicidal ideation. Yes, we pay to keep the libraries open 24 hours, and then students have to pay to get a membership at the gym and physical activity resources at Concordia prioritize elite student athletes, like prime hours at the ring and the use of the dome. But if we are expressing that we value equity, we aim to improve and support the physical and mental well-being of all students, then we will address the, uh, these things that can create um, a more access to those students, not just for elite performers. We know that the benefits of physical activity come from doing, not from excelling. Mm. Yeah, super important. That's great, Gabby. Um, Bill, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just wanna follow up on some comments that Lisa made. I, I, if I've understood her comments correctly, I hope I don't not misinterpret them, but I think that one issue is making sure that people realize that health is a process rather than an outcome, and that uh, it's dangerous to pathologize phenomenon that happen across a broadly defined normal distribution. Mm -hmm. So anxiety just isn't a form of psychopathology, but it's something that happens to people uh, some days more than others, and that it's an issue that people have to manage just the way they try to manage their physical health. And uh, that these are issues that intersect with the way that, that uh, all sorts of things happen at the university, how things are scheduled, um, the uh, timing for classes and things of this sort. Space available for people on the campus to hang around, see other people and so on. So um, and I was curious, Bill, how this, how the outcomes of the poll aligned with your own voting. And then I don't know if Shireen, were you trying to jump in there? I, I saw you. You're, uh, yeah, you're asking uh, me to reveal all my secrets. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, when I think about this, I had to reflect on my own. Uh, uh, I'm trying to decide what word to use. I guess I'll say I had to reflect on the, uh, my own department. You know, mm -hmm. there certainly, I think that there's a uh, 3.4 is a tough one because it's double barreled. Mm -hmm. You know, it says reduce mortality from non communicable diseases. So that's, but and then promoting mental health, not exactly the same thing. No. But I think that a lot of the research that's done in psychology is about mental health promotion. Um, there's a lot of research in psychology that's about uh, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Certainly, a lot of the people in CSBN are uh, thinking of Uri Shalev, for example. Uh, I think also of uh, Roy Sheen O'Connor, who has this big program on alcohol use that's uh, an important substance. So, yeah, these are uh, areas where I think we have strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. It uh, looks like Shireen may have had to log off. I'm not sure. I didn't. Oh, I'm here. Sense, but... Oh, there you are, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, you know, listening to, to Gaia and Lisa, um, when we talk about, you know, 3.4 and um, 3.8, um, especially within right now in the university community, and we're talking about promoting mental health and managers and supervisors and student facing individuals are becoming more impacted and seeing um, individuals with mental health issues. And we are not equipped um, on how to handle. And in addition, um, the resources are extremely stretched. Um, I just heard this week that, you know, a student wanting to get an appointment with a counselor in, in um, was a six month wait. Yes. So, you know, 
obviously when we look at all the these targets right now um you know reducing mortality is one thing but it's not even promoting mental health it's 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 how to navigate through this and how to provide you know even as a manager seeing our staff dealing with personal anxiety because they're being stretched all over the map and knowing how to react, what to say, what not to say, um, to a point that some managers may say, well, is she telling or he telling the truth? Um, you know, and so there is that piece that's really important if we want to improve on our targets to, um, to improve that piece of the education and additional resources. Yeah. So it does impact the universal health coverage from that perspective as well. Yeah, and that, I mean, the tension you pointed out between what might we aspire to do, like you know, if we're if we if we look at these SDGs and think, okay, let's really aim here. There's also the everyday limitations, and how do we how do we navigate between what we aspire to and what we can where we can start to try to make progress toward those broad goals. Guy, a quick a quick additional comment, and then we're gonna we're gonna take a five minute break before we get to the like what what might we do part of the exercise here today. Sorry, just super quick. It, it, it's um, when Bill started talking, I just glowed because he's absolutely correct. We medicalize things a bit too much. Sometimes we're just sad. That does not mean that we need a psychologist next to us helping us unpack yeah. our sadness. And that means that we can bring in a lot more providers of, of different skill sets to help us manage. To, to Shireen's point, if we need training and lessons, we need to, to offer it in a way that our community is most inclined to receive that training. So for students, that's gonna look differently because they understand credit courses but than it is for an employee. So I think there's just, I, I love what Bill was saying. So I was like, yes, Bill, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying that. Just let me say, make one more comment. You know, when this issue about anxiety being high in, in the fall, that's exactly what we see in school children. And the kind of anxiety that we see in the fall is that if you go into a classroom in the third week of September, you know, after you've done all this stuff that you have to do, the parent, all these important things that parental permission and so on, uh, test anxiety is really high. Uh, social anxiety is high, but not nearly as high as test anxiety. Test anxiety drops off as the semester goes on. And, and I think that, that one thing that, one way that people can sort of work that into their classes is to give a quiz at the end of the second week of class or the, in the third week of class, just to get people some idea of what's going on. So that those who are worrying without the need to worry are gonna say, hey, I'm doing okay, I got nine out of 10. It's not as bad as I thought. For people who are worrying and need to worry, it gives them some concrete evidence of, I better do something. But this kind of free floating, to use an old fashioned expression, this kind of free floating anxiety about tests and so forth doesn't help anybody. Yeah, that's easier done in some classes than others. Maybe Bill, you're suggesting a target of say X percent of Concordia courses have a course within the first two weeks, uh, quiz within the first two weeks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a recommendation. I don't you know, for some people it may not be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. uh, super interesting conversation, folks. We have uh, the outcomes of this poll and the further discussion about, um, you know, what, what Concordia has the most to contribute, which of these SDGs are most relevant to us. Um, if you have any, if you know, we're going to take a five minute break, if you have any further thoughts about what might we establish for ourselves as a set of Concordia targets related to health and well-being, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll take a break now and then we'll come back for the, like I said, for the ideation part of our of our uh, session here today. See you all in five minutes. Bill, did you say you have a you have another meeting at eleven? Yeah, I have to take off. I'm sorry. Oh no worries. Thank you. If, you. if you have ideas you want to put on the table, uh, go ahead and shoot us an email or uh, okay. get get in touch somehow. Okay, Thanks thank you. Morning. Thanks, okay. Bill, very much thank for you. your yeah. contributions. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. For, thank you for including me. Very Bye. Bye.
Hi, Cynthia. I'll just welcome you in. I noted you just joined us now. Uh, this is Anna speaking, Cynthia. Um, just to orient you, we are currently just taking a little five minute break and jumping back in at about 11.10. Cynthia, it's Jason Enns here. Glad you can make it. Sorry, were there were there issues with uh, with the link or with uh, accessing the session? Oh, you're you're still muted. Uh, yeah, the link wouldn't work. Oh. Um, and so, so and apparently, a pop up popped up that said that was an invalid meeting. ID, oh, no. but it like I couldn't access that originally. Like it wasn't reading it to me, so oh. I didn't know I didn't know where to go or what to do. Um, it just kept taking me to this page that said launch Zoom meeting, and it wouldn't do anything when I launched it. And so then when Anna sent it again, it was a whole different process. I had to go in and sign up, and um, so I'm not sure what happened. So apologies oh, <laughs> for joining late, but. Yeah. So, um, do you want me to give you a quick recap of? I mean, you you saw the agenda, and we've really it kind did. of just yeah worked worked through um, to to date. <clears throat> um, where well, first we just started at the high level of kind of like what are the benefits and limitations of the SDG framework, thinking about what's happening around health and well-being at Concordia, and then just finished a, a session thinking about which of the the SDG3 targets seem most relevant to Concordia uh, and or that we have the most to contribute to as an institution. And um, I just closed that window or else I'd read out to you <laughs> the results of that poll. <laughs> but the, if, as I recall, the, there was a strong focus on um, uh, the one that's focused on uh, uh, the, the one that's a bit of a mashup between reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases and promoting mental health. That's really, really two distinct things, but there was a clear emphasis on that one. Um, I'm just looking through the list again, or maybe, um, I don't know if Prem is back from his break. Oh, somebody just put it back up here. That's I'm, I'm here, Jason. Oh, okay. I was, I just didn't know who still had access to the poll results. Uh, I have access to them. Yeah, great. And you want me to read them out loud? Reposted them. Um, second most um, voted on target was around preventing and treating substance abuse. Third was supporting research development and universal access to affordable vaccines and medicines. And then fourth is improving early warning systems for global health risks. That's interesting. I didn't actually. Mm -hmm note that one to myself when we were talking about the results, but I'm curious what uh, what folks saw there. 
where we have that capacity or that's the most relevant to us. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Lisa, you're, you said in the chat that you have some issues with, with joining the Zoom as well. Maybe we should yeah. try to troubleshoot this. What was the? What was yeah, the so, so the, I had the same uh, issue as I think Cynthia was uh, talking about where I, the, when I, you know, you sent a, a, an invite. Yeah. And in the invite, there is a 35 at the end missing. Uh, the only reason I could, I could do it is because I went up and I went upstairs and, and, and talked to David and sort of, oh. fi we figured it out, but like the, the, there's a 35 missing at the end of the, of the oh, number. Strange. When I look at that, when I look at the Outlook invite in my own calendar, it includes the 35 at the end. I wonder what happened. Right. right. Yeah. But well, like, and I I'm didn't, not, I'm not in the teams. I'm not I didn't teams. have a link. So I didn't have oh. a link. And so in my calendar invite, um, like usually, you know, there's a bot, sort of an email oh. body almost that had the link in it. There was no link in it. Yeah, it was the link was in the location field. Right, the, the which is hard. But it's, yeah, it should be I, in the body. Your, yeah, your, well, and I okay. can't, for some reason, those links in the um, location part are not accessible. I can't open them. Ah, good to know. Or I don't know why that is. Like, I, it's just not one I've ever solved and it's and it's actually rare that I come across it so then yeah yeah um, that's, that's no I wasn't the only one <laughs> <laughs> it's super, super good to know and we'll I just we'll kept thinking it. oh this is the way my Friday is going and it's probably not going to get any better <laughs> well we hope the next oh, hour courage is going to be fine <laughs> yeah I'm thank sure you, the thank next you hour for... will be great Thank you for persisting, Cynthia. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. So I think just in the interest of time, we'll pick it up here again. Um, sorry, we've we've lost Bill and Lynn to other commitments. Uh, and Cynthia, thank you for joining us. So. <laughs> Um, and, uh, Cynthia hasn't maybe not introduced herself to the other folks here. Maybe just a quick yeah, Cynthia, who you are, what your what your role is at Concordia, and maybe what your like what interests you about the SDG framework. Oh, I'm Cynthia Bruce. I'm a assistant professor in creative arts therapies, um, and specifically music therapy. But I, you know, part of well, most of my focus actually is dis is critical disability studies and disability justice. And so, um, you know, I think what interests me in lots of ways is um, is connected to sort of the health injustice that disabled people have lived, and particularly during the pandemic. But not only during the pandemic, it's mostly made it much more visible. Um, you know, some of it having to do with accessibility, but lots of it having to do with, you know, the value we place on disabled lives or the way we, dis we devalue disabled lives. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that can be useful about the UN um, sustainability framework is, is honestly to leverage it um, to get people to pay attention. Super. Um, I'm just okay. noting maybe Prem, if you could take a note about we did we didn't actually specifically identify the critical critical disability studies group or initiative on campus and our kind of mapping of what's happening at Concordia, that might be a helpful thing to make a note of in that on that slide. Great. Okay, well, just to, to give a bit of a recap, um, particularly Cynthia, really sorry you had difficulty joining us. Um, we spent, uh, we spent a bit of time going through uh, identifying what the benefits and limitations of the SDGs. I mean, we recognize that we need to be, to engage them critically. Um, they're useful, but they have, they have some, there is some important cautions to using them. We also spent a little bit of time just looking at the landscape at Concordia in terms of activities um, that, uh, you know, what's happening around SDG three. And we've begun to articulate some, uh, some adapted targets 
that we might be able to orient around. Um, so what we'd like to do now is to, to really begin to think what we're, about what we're currently doing at the university in relation to health and well-being and consider ways in which we might be more impactful to contribute to, the, to efforts to the kind of targets we've identified. Um, so what we'd ask you to do is to think about what we can do or undertake as a university that, that helps attain the targets we've focused on. And from the, the poll that we took there just before the break, um, what really stands out, um, I'm not seeing the poll <laughs> anymore, but I think it was certainly 3.4, the reduced mortality. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, reduce mortality from non-communicable diseases and promote mental health. That was the top place. Uh, the second then was to prevent and treat substance abuse. We also had um, quite a number of people identify the support research development and you know, universal access to healthcare and yeah and this additional one the improve early warning systems for global health risks there's some others in there obviously the the achieving the universal health uh, coverage um, but what we want to do now is think think really a little more around those now that we've identified the those targets. Um, the idea isn't necessarily to dream up a bunch of new things to do. There's already a substantial body of health happening around health and well-being. Um, but we want to consider whether the SDGs challenge us to do things that we're not currently doing or help us articulate relevant targets for us to establish. So I'm not sure if we're going to break into groups or if we're going to stay as one. Jason, I think, is, I think we're about the right size to stay, stay as to a whole. Stay. Yeah. 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 OK. So what we want to do here is, is to think in two time frames, some immediate ideas. And we have the beginning of those. We've already had some really great ideas um, put forward. So thinking about immediate ideas, things that are big enough to matter and small enough to get done. And then also think about some longer term ideas, more aspirational um, in terms of a vision for where Concordia could be at in five years. Uh, we can focus on building on current work and or on proposing new efforts. We can include research, education, services, operations. I mean, really up to you. The ideas can be internal. And we've heard a lot about the importance of, you know, really paying attention to what's happening on campus. Um, we can think about ideas internally or externally. And in fact, I think it was, um, you know, a couple of you already underscored that there isn't such a distinction that really what we do on campus has implications for our ability to partner, for our engagement with a wider community. But um, so, so feel free to, you know, to, to think about on campus or, or uh, externally facing ideas. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we can open it up. You can talk about how you might want to amplify your own efforts, link to things that are being done, discuss uh, some examples of work that's happening elsewhere. Um, but I'll open the floor. Lisa, I see your hand there. Um, thank you. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot from uh, inside of the, the, the community, the Black community in particular, uh, as a psychotherapist, uh, I've been working a lot with, uh, with this idea of sustainability. Um, I know that, uh, like, for myself and for all of the colleagues in the, in the city, uh, waiting lists are just crazy. And uh, I think this is the same, same goes for 
uh, services. Um, d d uh, we were just talking about how even for in inside of the, the university, it takes six months to access a counselor. And I'm, I've been I've been working a lot with um, with building capacity and and working with sort of scaling impact with groups. So I've been starting to experiment and to well experiment. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, <laughs> experimenting, but like holding holding circles and 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 just like thinking about what is it that people need to get from point A to point B, right? And in this time, there's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of heaviness, right? Like people don't, like when, when I ask people to go from point A to point B, people are like, ah, point B, just hold on, I just want to be held right now, right? So we're not even at a point where we can move anywhere, right? Like we're like, so there are, I'm finding that we can look at things differently. I find that the ways in which, um, uh, yeah, in which uh, mental health services is thought and offered re reduces us and doesn't necessarily serve our communities. I'm curious, Lisa, how, um, I mean, you, you talked about working with other groups to, to yeah, the term you use was scaling impact. How, what, how do you see that working or how um, I, I'm just wondering if there's kind of a kernel of an institutional strategy that we might use through the way that you're approaching that kind of scaling and partnership and collaboration development. I'm, I'm, I'm not making like a I'm not I'm not being very revolutionary. Uh, I'm just using uh, like circles and and groups and the idea of for example training people and this is this comes from the community like we're, we're working with community partners for example right now and we know that within the community there are already uh, uh, ideas and frameworks that are really interesting for training for for building capacity for and this is something that we're, we're looking to to here I'm doing I think I'm shoring up here like to 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 push forward and to to lift and to to amplify right um I think that that's what we're thinking about also going forward uh I know that as soon as you open this possibility there are for example people coming uh, uh there are things around uh reproductive uh rights that are coming like reproductive rights that are coming like the the mental health piece around reproduction there's a, a piece around um, a prison, uh, uh, prison mental health, and how to scale that. Like for example, I don't I don't want to speak very much. Like it's just to think about what needs to be done for people. Like for example, when we're thinking about the the, the just like beginning to think about the prison things, there are very sort of concrete things that people, you know, in the black community, for example, there's a lot of mistrust, right? So people, there's not representation in terms of the people who are being, uh, who they're seeing, the people who are, are the, the inmates are not seeing people that, that resemble them. And when they are speaking to the people, whatever they say gets put into, into documents. There's not enough of us as a, as professionals to to supply how can we make it so that that the that the that the tasks are very well sort of prepped so that you have to do so that it's the lightest possible for the professional and the most the most space for the person so that the paperwork and the, just rethinking the different ways that we are working with each other. And I find that in, in groups, for example, we can speak to, we can hold groups together for the, for the emotional sharing sort of ideas, but also normalizing things in a, in a, in a big way. And also sort of like lifting, there's something that is uplifting in traveling together. Yeah. Anyways, so I, I don't want to get into, <laughs> 
That's really great, Lisa. I'm just wondering to what extent that 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 model that you're speaking to works on on campus in terms of the kind of support students give each other and how we can enhance that because you seem to be it's this moving away from expert driven care to to a model it, where I think it needs to be a, a, a scaffolded right yeah there's something that there has to be sort of capacity at every level right there's some things that you don't want anybody to be taken care of but you need people to be able to identify when do oh this is out of my i have to put it up right and so that it stays safe right and so if we are but even if as professionals we are in a role where we can support or hold a much larger sort of container where it it, it is lighter than one on one on one like this yeah yeah, yeah. I agree, Lisa, I agree with you. And um, because there's there's two ways. We have the immediate problem that we have now, like you said, there are, it's there and it's in front of us. But I think as people that work within a university, we have an enormous chance to sort of shape the next generation to have that in their head from the very beginning. And that hopefully by, by doing that, this next group that will be taking well, our places or, or, or further will understand that that's exactly the concept that they need to have. So I think there's addressing the problem now, but there's also preparing for the future with this sort of captive audience that we have of extraordinarily bright young people that, um, you know, I'm going to be really honest, I'm, you know, at, at the end of my career right, right now, 40 years ago, those things weren't really coming to the forefront. Students today recognize a lot of this. And I think it's an opportunity to, to take that and to move that to the next level so that you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, those things that you were speaking about will be almost second nature and not something that we have to think about doing. Thanks, Deborah. So and Anne-Marie, Gaia, and then Gabby. <laughs> um, hi, this is a very interesting conversation. Um, so thank you, everybody. and. I have a, a few ideas um, touching on, on different things that have been said. Uh, one is that, um, you know, health and wellness are really often considered the greatest resource of a community. And I think um, without um, ensuring or promoting better health um, of, of all community members, so whether that's faculty and staff or, or students, um, I think we won't go as far as we could if we if we really work to promote that. Um, one limitation I see as as um, manager of health services is a, a community health services is a dearth of information on sort of baseline health indicators or status of of of, of community members at Concordia. So. Um, I'd love to see us establish targets, but how will we measure our success if, if we lack information about, um, about our health or, or some indicators of, of those um, health um, measures? And um, I also wanna echo, I think we have to look at new ways of providing um, services and support to, to the community. And I really, um, found it interesting. Um, sorry, I'm not uh, sure what the, the last speaker's name is. I can't see everything with my phone, but um, working in new ways of offering services because demands, uh, we're seeing it particularly for mental health services, far exceed resources, particularly if we continue with models of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, expert to an individual. And I think, I know within health services, um, I've had several conversations just in the last week with psychiatrists or physicians about the benefits of group work, group therapy. Uh, so very much echoing what, what was said and, and, and that in fact, the benefits and the speed with which um, people progress is often far greater in a group setting than, than individually and that the group can, um, it creates a community um, support um, and it also um, normalizes to some extent and, and breaks isolation of people who are, who are struggling on their own. 
Um, and so I think we need to start looking at other models that could perhaps reach more people more efficiently than some of the models that we're currently employing. So I just wanted to echo that. I think these are interesting. Um, there are interesting opportunities for collaboration. Um, and lastly, I wanted to say again, I think this was mentioned a little bit, but that through uh, curriculum infusion, I think we could reach a lot more students um, in the classroom if, um, if health education, wellness, um, addressing some of, you know, lifestyle habits that are formed at this time in people's lives um, could be addressed in, in curriculum uh, where credits are, are provided. And I think we would be giving a very important lifelong gift to, to our students and helping them um, maintain their health for a lifetime. That's it. Sorry, there was a lot of, lot of things I've been accumulating. <laughs> A lot in there. I really love your point too about what you can't measure. It doesn't get noticed. That's really important. And the baseline, you know, that that data is so important. As a prof too, I mean, I feel, you know, the, the intervention profs and supervisors can make can be so useful, but they just don't feel they have the tools. So great points, Emery. Thank you so much. Um, Gaia, over to, to you, your question. Thank you. And I, similar to Anne-Marie, have a constellation of um, thoughts. So first of all, from what Lisa was saying, because that resonated to, with me, I'm going to say it in a slightly different way. And that is adopting the stepped care model approach when it comes to mental health, i.e. you introduce the most effective but least intrusive and resource intensive method first, and then you escalate as appropriate. This is considered best practice. Not enough institutions do this, and I think that there is area here for us to really latch on to. Um, another comment is around what I love about the pandemic, as crappy as it was, are some of the amazing opportunities that we latched on to. I have never seen the faculty be more adaptive to their student needs pre-COVID pre and be asked to be adaptive to student needs as it was pre-COVID, such that the ACSD is now having conversations like, you know what, my professor isn't giving me an accommodation anymore because, and, and when we investigate it, it's because the professor is, U, is doing UDL. That is a milestone for us. And I would love us to, con to continue exploring this area because that's, it's a, it's a beautiful outcome out of a really, really crappy situation. Um, I agree with Anne-Marie that and um, Deborah when we start talking about if we want to, if we're seeing the students are coming in with more stress and the inability to regulate their, their, their emotions, how do we teach them skills so that they're not only coming to counseling, for example, when they are in a heightened state? What can we do preventively? And there is significant research that that encourages us to think about a credit course. So I'd like Concordia to start thinking about this as we start um, entering our five year, you know, what have we done? Um, mental health, I love that it's getting a lot of airtime. We used to joke 10 years ago that mental health was the orphan child. It got no attention whatsoever. Now it's getting a lot of attention. But I also want us to bear in mind that there are other things that we need to focus on and not lose sight of. Otherwise, it will become the next quote unquote pandemic. And we don't want that to happen. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to mention was, again, based on our research is that we do a lot of really, really good work in September in building a sense of community. And then unfortunately, isolation and um, community cohesion starts to drop after that. We know that a sense of belonging positively influences mental health. So what are we doing? Or can we create targets around student life and, and, and community cohesion? That could be a really exciting um, dialogue to enter into. That's it. Fantastic. <laughs> so much in that. Um, we'll keep moving on, Gabby. Thank you so much. Um, to, to build on what's been shared so far, I, I would love to see us help the university meet the commitments that we've already made and bring to life what we already know. For example, strategic directions three 
uh, says that we should support approaches that help students achieve positive life outcomes. Uh, and there's so much connection between uh, academic success and healthy lifestyle behaviors. We've been signatory on the Okanagan Charter since 2018. And at that time, Dr. Ostige wrote that we would work to infuse prevention and well being into the very core of Concordia's academics and operations. The Concordia Health and Well Being Review elicited recommendations from students, and they asked for health behaviors to be taught in classrooms. And that they are, they, they highlighted that they're most inclined towards that information being in credit level courses. They also asked that uh, we develop recreation spaces for informal connections, giving the example of table tennis. And I know Anna, when they, you set up the table tennis table in the fourth space, it was constantly being used and to see the joyful kids using it. The Concordia's Working Group on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion highlights fair access, uh, which includes, as I mentioned before, access to physical activity for all students, not just those who can afford to pay for the gym or our elite performers. So building on what we've already committed to and what we already know. Thank you, Gabby, so much in that. Uh, Cynthia. So I think like you, I think like everybody, I have a sort of constellation of things going on in my head as I think about all of this. Um, it, but it struck me as, um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your name who's, who spoke and mentioned UDL and all of the ways that we have seen the implementation of UDL. Um, I, you know, I really, I wonder about the opportunities to think through you know, the connections between UDL and wellness and well-being for students. I certainly see it in my students. Um, I mean, I've taught using it for a long time um, because I, I, my, my doctorate is in education. I do disability studies in education. So I really think through what it means to, to teach accessibly. Um, and I really find um, that UDL, you know, building in flexibility reduces the need for students to, to be self-advocates. And we know that self-advocacy in particular in university contexts is a significant additional burden on students. Um, and so the extent to which they don't have to advocate for access um, really increases, I think, their sense of well-being. Um, you know, it makes them, um, you know, feel like they're asking permission less and less and less. And so I just, I think it's a really interesting opportunity. One thing that I have found um, is that while we've adopted it and latched onto that amazing opportunity, there's also, I hear lots of discussion about this sort of being the pandemic stop gap, right? So um, the, the kind of flexibility that I tend to build in, for example, around, um, you know, due dates and deadlines, um, I just build it in all of the time, but I often hear people saying, well, that's just, we're just doing that because of the pandemic. And I actually think it's just really good practice. I find students, you know, do get things to me quite honestly, more quickly when they just know flexibility is how we work. So if we're flexible and responsive. Um, and then the other thing that I, I see as a real opportunity at Concordia, it's one of the reasons that I decided to apply to Concordia and come is, um, all of the pathways, I guess, that I see um, through, through some research centers, like research and, and clinical centers in lots of ways, like the center, new Center for the Arts and Health, the Center for the Arts and Human Development, um, really important opportunities to creatively mobilize lived knowledge and, and look at all of the ways that the lived knowledge of disability in my context can, um, be infused in curriculum. So, you know, in the creative arts therapies and beyond, I would say in education and psychology, um, the ways that the lived knowledge of disability can be, um, you know, mobilized for greater public awareness. So I just see some really good opportunities in, in thinking through how that knowledge can be mobilized to support um, expanded understandings of what it means to live well, uh, with disability.
Thanks, Cynthia. Andrew. Just wondering, Jason, in terms of if, if you wanted to, just in terms of the timing, or are we okay to continue? Uh, yeah, it's, I think I think you know taking five ten more minutes if others have things that they'd want to surface. Again, we're what we're trying to do here is capture, um, again both both longer term aspirations. What can what can we put out there as our north star? But then also what might we undertake in the relatively near term to start us on that on that way and maybe you know maybe a, a broader push around UDL as a, as a candidate for that kind of that kind of thing that we can commit to institutionally and kind of rally around that's one potential I'm just curious I I've been taking notes here but I don't have like a second or third thing that I would I would just put out there but if others either reminding me of something I've forgotten here quickly or they have other things that you'd want to suggest. That's kind of what we're looking to gather here is this sense of what's the potential, what's the opportunity, what might we we work together on uh, under the impetus of this initiative around the SDGs. What is and, and also what do they challenge us to do that we're just not able to deliver on right now? Gaia, did you want to come in? Because I think some of you had some ideas there that could could I think work within this relatively short period too. We've got five years to do this, right. Um, <laughs> or, or 18 months uh, or next week. <laughs> well, I love, um, so C Cynthia and I started the conversation around universal design for learning. And Jason, I love that you identified it as one thing that we should be delivering on within the next five years. I think that would be powerful. And, and that can absolutely intersect with um, helping reduce stress and anxiousness within our student population. So something that we absolutely have to invest in. Let's do that. Um, I'd love for us to, and this is further to Gabby's point, because she's absolutely correct. We've been talking about how important it is to, to have credit courses or some mechanism to teach students um, resiliency skills and how they can emotionally regulate. We've been talking about it for a while, but we haven't moved far. We know that credit courses resonate with students. And I would really like for us within the next five years to, to deliver on our own promise of wanting to do this. That would be phenomenal. I will throw a vote. And this is just my lens. So everyone else, please feel free to, have, to, to throw their lens as well. I'm excited that, we're, that Concordia is um, adopting the Post -second, the standard for post-secondary mental health and well-being for students. So that's going to help us do some wonderful work within mental health. Um, I, I'd like to see more work done in how we conceptualize student life as an integral part of the university experience because students talk to us consistently about how their sense of, of um, identity uh, is influencing their experience at Concordia and their and their mental health. And indeed, I've got research data that indicates that um, this is an area that, that requires our scrutiny. Harris, I'm just gonna pose a question here. Um, I, I have a colleague who's, who's um, interested in uh, this uh, is kind of in response to this idea of, of curriculum integration. I have a colleague who's, who's uh, currently giving some attention to this, the, the integration of kind of mindfulness practices into courses and curriculum and programs. I'm wondering if how folks think about that and if that is a potential uh, additional component to, to UDL or if that fits in the picture at all here for, for folks. Yeah, Lisa, others jump in. Yeah, Lisa. Oh. Uh, Jason, I wanted to add, um, you, you were talking about the three things, I wanted to add Anne-Marie's uh, idea around the measurings, so without being, no. uh, you know, something that is, uh, uh, you know, I know that like, for example, when, when I'm working in the, in the arts, there's always sort of like a pushback against the, the, the measure, so we need to find uh, uh, the, the targets qui sont that are that are interest that are in, that are interesting for everybody to reach but I think that it's a it's a really important thing to know a baseline and then to know where it is that we want to go um, 
And then uh, I was thinking about um, mindfulness. You were talking about mindfulness. And I think that there are some sort of skills that are really, really useful. Um, mindfulness, we have to be careful in terms of sometimes with trauma, it's not the, 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 the best. So we have to, we have to, um, there has to be like a, a caveat there. But I think that, yeah, there are different kinds of, of, of mindfulness. And I feel like um, the, the, the sort of the, the, the shift from judgment to sort of curiosity and, and is a very, very important one as a, as a posture. Could I just, uh, uh, sorry, Jason, if I could just come in on a point, just this idea of the courses. I mean, that sounds like a, a really wonderful idea, but I, I mean, again, as a prof, I mean, I, I'm in a department geography where we teach a lot about climate change and environmental degradation. So there's a, a lot of, a lot of students experience this climate grief, the despair at taking courses, programs, such as ones that are offered in departments like, like mine. And I wonder if there could be some training, some advice to faculty about how to message that, about how to be more positive so that it's not just an extracurricular activity that we take care of the students' mental health on the side, but that we fully integrate it into their journey through our courses and programs, but that we, we really target particularly um, courses that, that can or tend to be a little bit more disturbing in terms of their content. I can start and then Gabby, you can absolutely um, add on, please. So what you're speaking to Monica um, speaks to the entire notion of um, curriculum infusion. How do we bring health and wellness into the classroom? So in, in a class on mathematics, for example, and I'm just using mathematics, it just came, it just came to me. Um, how do we bring in, for example, how um, a mental health model, for example, and, and students see how anxiety, for example, is um, changing over time. And, and you're using that as an, as the ability to both teach math, but to also teach some, some basic skills around um, how to you on on how you can access resources if a student is feeling anxious. So there are ways of building some health education into existing curriculum. That's on the light side of it. On the really intensive side of it is that you just create a course that is entirely purpose built around teaching skills around resiliency and emotional regulation. Gabby, do you want anything to add to that? Thank you so much. Um, absolutely. And what students have emphasized is that they want it to be built into the course's grading scheme. Otherwise, few students will be willing or able to invest time into it. Um, and then when it's it's infused, and the, the research on curriculum infusion has shown that there are many ways that these connections um, can be made uh, to infuse the health topics, health content. But I'll just give one example on nursing students. When uh, mindfulness was offered as an extracurricular they had a, a, a um, component, they had a handful of participants when it was built into the curriculum, the students participated and raved about um, the learning and the benefits. And so curriculum infusion is evidence. There's a lot of, of uh, research on it. And there's many different uh, intensities or packages uh, in, in order to integrate it. Thank you both. Jason? Uh, I think I had a question, but I forgot it, but that's fine. Um, anybody else want to add anything here uh, before we kind of do a, a last wrap up on North Stars or things to potentially focus on in the in the closer term? And we're, we're used the phrase big enough to matter and small enough to get done, which is borrowed from the Brookings Institution. Not just doing things, but doing things that matter but not also taking on so much that we, we can't actually accomplish anything. So any last um, contributions or thoughts or things that you'd like to get on the table or recorded in the discussion? 
Very yeah. sorry. Yeah. Does does curriculum infusion mean that people get to also? Is it like sometimes in in um, in in educational frameworks there is um, there is what is taught so the map la matière the the, the 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 matter and then there's the practice and and things are sort of separated especially in in questions of mental health often things are separated and i'm wondering if uh, curriculum infusion means that people get to to practice things together because if it does then then i think there's something really exciting there there we go so experiential learning is a way that um, health can be infused into curricula uh, it could also be as Gaia gave the example of using examples so for example business students um, looking at the impact of substance misuse on workforce productivity uh, it could be a little bit bigger than that that it could be an entire elective course or um, uh, a, a requirement a degree requirement all the way to a minor where students can choose to focus a chunk of their learning on a health and wellness and mental well-being topic but it can play out as experiential learning or assignments or examples that are being used that's great well, thanks good. thanks everyone and we've uh we've duly taken note and and um it's just a really rich set of possibilities here. So a uh, quick, um, um, just a, a sense of kind of wh where this is going. So as you know, we are on room three out of 17. So we have a bit of work to do and a lot more discussions to have in other domains related to the SDGs. So we're kind of just getting started, um, but we really are aggregating, aggregating this input and really trying to tease out where, is, where the strongest possibilities that Concordia can really make a difference and be and lean into this, this SDG framework. Um, so we have, um, you know, a lot more um, discussions to have, a lot more people to talk to, a lot more assessment to do of kind of like where the opportunities are. Um, if you have people that you'd want to identify as other people that we need to talk to in relation to the health and well-being issue, please do let us know. We realize that not everybody who's relevant to this conversation is here today, and so please either shoot us a note or put in chat who else you think would need to be involved in a conversation about Concordia's health and well-being related efforts. Um, and um, yeah, so we're we're on the path to completing the 17 rooms exercise and then and then reporting back through what's called a voluntary university review, which is just an institutional self-assessment in relation to the SDG framework. For you, there are opportunities, um, uh, a, a range of opportunities to pursue kind of project level work that we can we can point you to. We don't have a like a, a clear offer that says like here's your opportunity, but um, we do. There is something that's coming out in the research space with respect to SDG oriented um, seed grants that um, teams will be available to apply to. Monica, I don't know when the timeline is for announcing that, but it's in the Relative Monday, order. actually. <laughs> Sorry, Monday? Monday. <laughs> Monday, okay. So there is a research-oriented um, program that's being announced, seed granting program, uh, and there may be some other opportunities that we make available um, at the conclusion of the 17 rooms exercise. We don't give the early folks the head start. <laughs> I'm trying to wait and make it fair for everyone, but there may be some opportunities that we um, make available in terms of support for projects and initiatives that come out of the 17 rooms exercise. And uh, if you just want to do any follow-ups with any of us here today, feel free to reach out. And um, um, yeah, I, th I think that's that's kind of our concluding note. Any other last thoughts that people want to put on the table? If not, um, there's a very quick uh, survey that'll pop up in your web browser after we conclude here today that just gives you an opportunity to weigh in on the format of today's session and um, give input for improvement or suggestions for us. Uh, we'd appreciate you take just the last uh, two minutes of your time before, before noon to give us some feedback. Otherwise, we really appreciate the investment of your time and your energies and your focus and your great ideas here today. And uh, 
Just thanks a lot for participating. Thanks so much. Amazing group, so much happening. It's really encouraging to see and <laughs> such amazing people working on these, these issues. So thank you so much for your contributions and look forward to keeping in touch. And thank you, uh, Monica and Jason, for leading us through this exercise once again. Uh, we, we do recognize that it's, it's a co commitment and investment of time as well for everybody involved. And uh, thank you all for hanging in there with us as long as you could here today. So we will close up the Zoom now, and we do encourage you to go ahead and spend an extra minute or two on that exit survey, if you would. It, we would be grateful for it. Thanks, everybody, and see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. I don't know.